Hello fellow tropers and welcome to episode 5 of Tropecast. And now we move on to we move on to a B trope in this section. And the trope I've chosen to cover for the letter B is Blitz Evacuee. And this is part one of that. Now there are eight examples within this trope. So there will be two used per episode here. And we start, as ever, with anime and manga. In Barefoot Gen, Japanese children are sent off to the countryside so they won't be threatened by bombing. Akira, the only one of Na Naka Nakayoka's children selected for evacuation, decides to sneak back to Hiroshima, and his family has trouble persuading him to return to where the food is no better and other irritations are worse. For all their hardships, at least the children sent away survived the war. Many of their relatives don't. And for this episode, we're going to end on live-action films. Here we go. Spoilers ahead. The 2015 horror film The Woman in Black, Angel of Death features a group of children evacuated to an old dark house where they encounter the titular woman in black, a vengeful spirit from the late 1800s who kills children whenever she is seen. In retrospect, they really should have taken their chances with the Luftwaffle. Bed knobs and broomstick uses the honest family as the host family as magic example to start the plot. Three kids orphaned in the Blitz are sent to the country and find out they're living with a witch in training. Incidentally the movie star Angela Lansbury was a Blitz evacuee herself. The Limey Goes to Hollywood version. In Nanny McPhee Returns, the cousins sent to live on the farm are refugees from London during World War One. What? It's clearly said during the 1940s. Discussed in Battle of Britain, where one pilot reading mail from home is irritated to learn that after going through considerable trouble to get his family moved into the country, his wife is writing to complain that she's bored and wishes to return to London. And finally, for all you Japanese fans out there, Memoirs of a Geisha. Sayuri was evacuated to the countryside from Tokyo during the American bombings. Okay, we're going to have to use another example here to fill out the time. So we'll go into literature. Kit Pearson's trilogy, The Sky is Falling, Looking at the Moon and the Lights Go On Again, deals with the fish out of water concept as 10-year-old Nora and her 5-year-old brother Gavin are shipped from Kent in the southeast of England to Toronto, Canada. The first book features Nora's homesickness and resentment of Canada. The second, her adjustment to adolescence, while the third is Gavin's unwillingness to go home. Blank. Carrie's War by Nina Borden is about two children evacuated to Wales. Lord of the Flies a very, uh, very cruelly combines the first two types while being evacuated from World War Three, World War Three. The kid's plane crashes and the pilot dies, leaving them to explore the island paradise, an island paradise without adults. 
Never land much. Most of them learn to like the island so much, they don't care about being rescued. But by the end of the book, they have done a lot of damage to the island anyway. In A Tale of Time City by Diana Wynne, uh, by Diana Wynne Jones. Vivian is sent to the country to live with her cousin but is abducted by time travellers after she gets off the train. The Pevensey children in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe go to live with a professor they've never met. His mansion contains the wardrobe that they discover leads to Narnia. The novel by Michelle Magorian and TV film Goodnight Mr. Tom is a type 3 old geezer, Tom Oakley, is forced to look after a shy boy evacuated from London and gradually grows to like him. Then the boy is called back home by his abusive mother, but Tom goes to London to rescue him. Also by Michelle Magorian, back home, about an evacuee girl's experience when she returns to her family, is one. Now this one was made into a movie too, as she was evacuated to America. So a very modern family, she experiences a lot of fish out of water on her return, having to adjust to a very different and much poorer culture. Michelle Magorian's third drawing from this well is a little love song, not swan, not a swan, which is about a 17 year old Rose and her big sister Diana. They are sent to the English countryside in 1943 and end up living alone in a cottage outside a village. Well, they were 18, aren't they really? Old enough to look after themselves? <laughs> the protagonist of Mary Norton's Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. Broomstick. And as a result of its Disney adaptation, see above. In Josephine Fay's The Franchise Affair, evacuee Betty Kane was orphaned during the Blitz and remained with the family who took her in, who were doting foster parents. Unfortunately, she turned out to be a case of like mother, like daughter, and eventually slandered the lawyer protagonist clients to cover up some of her activities. In Evelyn Wells' novel, Put out more flags. The protagonist makes money off an abominable group of urchins by leaving them with different families and then blackmailing the families into removing them from their home. The backstory to Mousetrap has something like the Doctor Who example below with an abusive rural family. In Aunt Dimnity Digs In, several of the current residents of Finch are revealed to have first come to the village as these during World War II, and they return there to live later in their lives because of the pleasant memories and the feeling of sanctuary the place gave them. The children's fantasy novel Drift House gives this as mo give this a modern upgrade. Instead of being sent from London during World War Two, the kid heroes come from New York City directly post 9/11. Their parents sent them to live in the countryside with their uncle after fearing that New York City is no longer safe. Terry Pratchett's Johnny and the Bomb features one who's having trouble adapting to small town life, complains erroneously, of course, 
about the fact that the milk there seems to come out of the cow's bum. What? <laughs> what have I just read? That's truth in televisions, uh, based on real stories about London evacuees knowing nothing about where meat and milk come from. So unlike now, obviously. Johnny was able to effectively disguise himself as one. The others, not so much. The Molly line of American Girl books features Emily Bennett, an evacuee sent to live with Molly's family in the US. They bonded over their mutual admiration of the English princesses, and Emily helped Molly put on a proper tea for her birthday party. In the film of the book, she is given a much more prominent role. Connie, Wallet, Connie Willis uses this periodically. Her SF novel, Light Raid, stars a, an evacuee protagonist running away from her evacuee home, dodging evac wardens and blank, are big parts of the plot, oh, and finding something to wear. One of the time-travelling protagonists for, of her novel, Blackout, goes to the past in order to study evacuees. 13 Never Changes by Buzz, Budge Wilson deals with this trope. However, the story is told from the point of view of a Canadian girl who has to adjust to an English girl living with her family, as well as the many other children who have also arrived, including a rich girl her best friend immediately bonds with, the rich girl's handsome cousin and a snotty younger girl. Averted in the Doctor Who Eighth Doctor Adventures with Fitz Kreiner. He was four years old at the beginning of World War Two, but well know the surname. His father was German, so there should be Kreiner or Kreiner. Okay. His parents sensibly realized the second variant of this trope was almost inevitable, so he stayed in London. Unfortunately, there were still more than enough other kids left in London to see to it that he got a pretty awful time of it. Yes, because thanks to the Nazis, the Germans were responsible for the war. My Family for the War has an odd version. Francica Mangold was already an evacuee escaping from Germany on kinder transport. Her first foster family was a wonderful family. Though surprised at having accidentally taken in a Christian child, both sets of grandparents had converted long before she was born, but she counts as Jewish to the Reich, which is stupid because she's not Jewish. But the second set was awful and got on her case for being German. And rightfully so. Happily, she is able to return to her first foster family before too long. Unhappily, her actual father dies and she is never really able to reconcile with her mother after the war. And, okay, Insipu. Insipu, Insipu tells the story, tale of 11 evacuees who ship to the US sinks. They are stranded on an island where they establish an independent society. Okay, now this will now be a two-parter rather than a four-parter. Because we're going to go through the rest of the categories in the trope next time. Until then, bye. Hello, fellow tropers, and welcome to episode six of Tropecast. This is, is going to be the final part of the Blitz Evacuee. 
So this is our last episode under the letter B for this series. And live action TV. Mrs. Slocum of Are You Being Served continually mentions having been a land girl during the war. However, she's always very vague about exactly how old she was when it happened. Her experience is elaborated upon when the cast retire to the country in grace and favour. Call the Midwife references this form, that this from time to time. Since it is said in the, set in the mid 1950s East London, it's never directly shown, but some popular residents reference being evacuated. Doctor Who has used this a few times. In the original series, the seventh Doctor story, The Curse of Fenric, features several evacuees actually in the countryside. The Empty Child and the Doctor Dancers features a gang of homeless children living in London during the Blitz. At least some of them are evacuees who then ran away from their host families, though others may be orphans. Abuse is implied. The Doctor, the Widow and the Wardrobe features a mum and her two kids getting sent out to an old mansion where the Doctor plays caretaker. The BBC reality television programme Evacuation was all about this, taking a group of modern day children and putting them into the situation the evacuees faced. Also seen on Foil's War, one episode plays with version 2, the young evacuee is unhappy, but more because he's been separated from his family and the life he's known and familiar, and not because of any abuse. The mother and father of the family who are taking him in aren't exactly welcoming, but they aren't actually abusive either, and the daughter tries hard to make him feel welcome and cared for without success, partly because she herself is lonely, trapped and miserable in this family and thought, erroneously, that the experience would be something like version 3, which we can't read because there's a blank space there. In Frankie Howard, Rather You Than Me, Dennis was evacuated as a kid, during which time he thought his mother had died. It wasn't until after the war that he found out that she was alive and that she wanted him to believe she was dead because she ran off with another man. Bitch! Abandoning your child like that. Horrible Histories has a sketch that recounts the real-life descriptions that evacuees gave of things they encountered in the country, like cows, as if it were a trailer for a horror movie. The BBC Schools programme Look and Read had a storyline called Spy Watch about a group of evacuees who suspect there's a Nazi spy in the village. The framing story was about one of the evacuees returning to the village in the present day and helping create a World War II display for the local library. Mulberry, a BBC fantasy series featured Bert and Alice Finch who had come to the manor that is the setting decades ago as a pair of evacuated Cockney children and ended up settling in for life and marrying each other. Uh, brother and sister marrying each other? Incest people? Torchwood as an elderly man with a London accent living in Wales, he was sent there during the Second World War when he and when his family died, his Welsh foster home adopted him. Music In the World War Two song There Will Be Bluebirds Over, The White Cliffs of Dover, 
One of the promises about tomorrow is the return of one such evacuee. Jimmy will go to sleep in his own little room again. Such a heartwarming promise. <laughs> Okay. Radio. In one of Dennis Norden's humorous monologues on My Word, he reminisced about his own time as an evacuee in 1935 for some reason. A type one with the daughter of the couple he was billeted with teaching him the ways of the country. Also, just how clueless the young Norden was about nature was taken up to eleven. Oh, look, Annie! I cried joyously. Is that what they call wild honeysuckle? Nay, she'd answer. Is it a climbing convolvulus? Or convolvulus? Nay, lad. What is it then? It's a goat. Okay, video games. In the Lost Town, two of the ghosts Nigel encounters are brother and sister evacuees who died young and can't rest because they're still waiting for their father to return from the war. And then finally we got real life. Averted by the royal family, despite constant pleas from Winston Churchill's cabinet to send her daughters to Canada to escape the Blitz, Queen Elizabeth, the consort of George the Sixth, sto stoically replied, The children won't go without me. I won't leave the king, and the king will never leave. Overlap with Limey Goes to Hollywood, or Roddy McDowell, Liz Taylor, who was born in England to American parents and some other British child actors of the era. The town of Stockport in Cheshire has an association with the Channel Islands refugees who escaped the islands, especially of Jersey, just before the German occupation was re were relocated here for the duration of the war. Many of the evacuees were children sent off the island rather and allow them to fall into German hands. At least one remained there after the war, and several generations of boys were taught Channel Island French by him at the local grammar school. So long as the Blitz and a sustained government effort are required, the Soviets would have the British trumped at 25 million evacuees. Fictional examples alone have not been fully accounted for. The focus, however, was not on the civilian population. The priority was to, take, was to evacuate thousands of manufacturing plants with tens of thousands of trains worth of industrial equipment shipped east of the Ural Mountains put back into use and the new factories built around them, sometimes in that order, the Reds with rockets and reserves, because by 1942 the Soviet industrial production took the lead from Germany and kept it throughout the war. It was done on the other side too with the KLV Kinderland Bershikon or relocation of children to the countryside during the worst of the Allied bombing of German cities. 
close to half a million German children, mostly from Hamburg and Berlin, but also from Cologne, Dresden and Dusseldorf, were relocated by 1941 with uh, there should be an estimated total of nearly 3 million by the end of the war. Children were moved either to host families or government-sponsored KLV camps. And with that, guys, I can safely say That puts an end to the B section of our beginning tropes. And we go under C. And the trope for that I'm going to choose. Well, there's only two of them. And I'm going to choose the chili reception tropes. And that's next time. Until then, bye. And welcome to episode 7 of Tropecast. Now we're moving on to the C section of the trope. And I've chosen to cover Chili Reception. This is part 1 of 3. And it's going to be covering from anime and manga to comic. Sorry, to fan works. So, anime and manga. In Kaleido Star, Sora gets ridiculed by almost the entire cast because of a misunderstanding, if you're feeling forgiving, or because of the cast drawing their obvious conclusions, if you're not. They assume she cheated her way in because of her unorthodox admission into the crew. Compounding the problem was Layla lecturing her in front of the other perspective of perspective stage members and she joined slightly later than the other rookies, making her the odd woman out. Q saw her being lumbered with an unfair amount of the chores and ridiculed at every opportunity even by her future true companions, Mia and Anna, unfortunately, fortunately, it gets better. Alice Academy Meekin's introduction to, to the Academy is basically out and out bullying. The Alice children are pretty messed up anyway, with cliquish and arrogant behaviour being considered the norm, so a newcomer was always going to have a hard time fitting in. Meekin makes, th makes things worse for herself by not being an Alice, at least, as far as she knows, and berating the other children for her better-than-now attitude. Her blithe spirit wins her classmates over. In Kiyokara Mawa, uh, Ma Mawa, Yuri is not what Wolfram and Gwendol wanted in a demon king, chosen one, or not. He doesn't have a clue about the demon kingdom and its politics. That changes pretty quickly, with Wolfram falling head over heels for him, and, Gwend and Gwendol establishing himself as a reasonable authority figure, prone to cuteness overlo uh, overload. In the Sakura Wars OVA and television series, Sakura gets a chilly reception, particularly since she's a country mouse. At least Maria 
the then captain gives her some credit despite the straight talking and gets Sakura on stage as soon as possible. See below for video game examples. One Piece Nico Robin Only Luffy knew on, of her good nature. The others knew her as a villain, and one that had been particularly cruel to their former true companion, Vivi. What follows is an incredible display by Robin, where she manages to defrost all of them by playing off their personality quirks. Except for Zoro, who remained cold until one heartwarming moment in Sk Skypia? Eureka 7. In the beginning, all the members of Gecko State, besides Eureka, treat Renton with apathy and disrespect, constantly mocking him, playing cruel pranks on him, blaming him for every little mishap, beating the crap out of him, and generally treating him as the crew's resident butt monkey until he takes a level in badass and stands up to Holland. Keep in mind Renton is 14 and most uh, almost everyone else is on the ship on, on the ship is an adult. Okay, in Puella Magi Madoka Magica, this happens to and a huge blank. You can't read what's on the few on the huge blank. Sorry guys. Moving now on to comic books. Top ten. Joe Pye initially gets a cold response from some of the other cops, mostly because he's taking the place of a colleague who was killed in the line of duty, he quickly proves himself both on the streets and his new partners and with his new partner's family. Okay, fan works. Again, we don't have very much here. Well, My Mirror Sword and Shield. Suzaku gets this reaction twice when he first joins the Royal Guard and later the Knights of Round. This is mostly due to racism and the assumption that he slept with Emperor Leluk or Lelouch, uh, Lelouch to get his position. They never warm up to him and both groups end up getting dissolved when the Royal Guard is wiped out in their first battle and the Knights of Ground attempt a coup. Well, okay guys, um... That, I'm afraid... Is it for this episode? Because I said three categories per episode. Because I want to keep this as a free parter. But that should satisfy your opening needs for this trope. In part two, we cover the animated film to live action TV examples. Until then. Take care. Hello, uh, fellow tropers, and welcome to episode 8 of Tropecast. This is part 2 of the Chili Reception Trope, and we're going to be covering animated films to live action TV. Those are the categories for this episode. So let's dive straight in. Animated films. Kung Fu Panda, as Poe admits his first few days after being declared as a dragon warrior, were awful. 
with all his heroes except for Master Ugwe, making it clear they hated him and wanted him gone. Of course, he starts impressing most of the five with his tireless tenacity and good cooking and humour. Shifu turned around, seeing how phenomenally quickly he is learning martial arts, and finally Tigress changed her mind after he defeated Tai Lung. Literature In the Circle of Magic books, the four protagonists are all given a hard time when they arrive at Winding Circle, resulting in their removal to Discipline Cottage. Protector of the Small by Tamora Pierce Kel hasn't even set foot in the castle for her page training before she's being hazed, having been put on probation by her training master. Needless to say, the boys she trains with don't exactly improve matters. She makes friends and triumphs regardless. Menely, a musician in the Dragon Riders of Pern series, is accepted by almost everybody in Harper Hall, but the ones who object to her presence make her life hell. A rare example of the protagonist not winning everyone over. Instead she settles for getting her own back. Captain Lawrence, the human protagonist, in Tamare in Tamare in, in the, of the Tamare series, received this treatment from many of the start of his aerial corpse career, for reasons ranging from his starting out in the Royal Navy to envy over him gaining the affections of a rare Chinese dragon, to his response to the friendly and well-mannered overtures of a pilot that turned out to be an abusive jerk-ass. Warrior Cats In a dangerous path after Greystripe is exiled from RiverClan and returns home to ThunderClan, some of the ThunderClan cats treat him coolly because of his fling with the RiverClan she-cat, Silverstream. Firecat tells him, to just ignore them, and soon enough he gets treated more warmly when he exposes Darkstripe trying to murder Sorrel Kit. You following me, guys? On to our final category for this episode. Live Action TV NYPD Blue When Simone replaced Kelly Sipowitz What a name Gave him an extremely cold reception It was basically Simone How do you pronounce that then? Oh, Hi, I'm Detective Simone Sipowitz, hi, how are you doing? Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, no, not that one. <laughs> I just had, I had just had to read it like that. Uh, Sipowitz goes to a Dar a Dar Chief's office. Goes to Dar Chief's office. Sipowitz, yeah, this new guy is not work. It's not working out. This was purposeful on the producer's part, because they felt that if Sipowitz gave Simone an extreme cold shoulder and rejected him without giving him any chance, viewers would, would be more likely to see that and not to do it themselves. NCIS, it takes a lot for anyone on Team Gibbs to warm up to any newcomer. Notably, McGee, who was more sympathetic to the newcomer, Ziva, 
since he was the old newcomer, Power Rangers. Rears his ugly head a couple of times in response to the rookie Red Ranger. Specifically, Taylor isn't fond of Cole in Power Rangers Wild Force. And Sky gives Jack the cold shoulder in Power Rangers SPD, if you haven't seen these yet. Spoilers. In both cases, it's less of a problem that a new guy is coming in, and more that they're automatically promoted to leader. Taylor and Sky are by-the-book types, with the most experience in their teams, and they didn't like suddenly having to take orders from rookies who don't particularly care for the rules. And for Sky's case, Jack's criminal past just prior to joining the team is probably a factor as well. Power Rangers Time Force had a Jen being a bit cold towards had Jen being a bit cold towards Wes, partly because he was inexperienced and also his resemblance towards a deceased boyfriend. I believe that was a fiance. Though done with a much smaller team, this trope is everywhere on the X-Files. In the pilot, Mulder is none too thrilled to be having a new partner, and is snarky more so than usual. Until about mid-season one, he fluctuates from being standoffish and friendly towards Scully. And we don't need to read the script moments. The truth is he's not wrong. Scully's mandate in being assigned to the X-Files is to provide evidence that Mulder is wasting Bureau resources and give their superiors cover to shut him down. This does... They didn't foresee that she would side with him on a need to investigate the unknown, even as she disagrees with his conclusions. Of course, once he and Scully become friends as well as partners, he's not too fond of his superiors, assigning even temporary partners in her absence. Scully acts in a similar way to the addition of Agent Doggett in Season 8, Though, to be honest, he could have started off the partnership on a a better foot. He lies about having known Mulder and tells Scully that Mulder never really trusted her, which led to this. John Doggett, you might have introduced yourself. I was getting around to it. The addition of Monica Reyes ironically didn't garner much attention from everyone, from anyone, positive or negative. This could have been partially because Scully and Mulder were no longer really on the X-Files and Monica and Doggett have worked together before. This happens to varying degrees in Stargate SG-1 and Stargate Atlantis. How chilly the reception seems to be in the direct proportion to how popular the preceding character was and how their exit was handled. Jonas Quinn was never really well received by O'Neill or the audience. Ronan Dex was loved as soon as he showed up in Atlantis. Oddly enough, even though Richard Woosley was designed to be a shifty character, everyone got over the chilly reception pretty quick and accepted him as expedition leader. Criminal Minds The team is so close-knit that it takes a couple of episodes for a new member to fit in with a dynamic Prentice is a notable example. She got the cold shoulder at first because she showed up 
in the BAU and Hotch and Gideon didn't sign off on her transfer. Strauss only put her on the team because she could dig up secrets to bring down Hotch. Prentice definitely proved herself later by not whispering in Strauss's ear. And she was officially accepted by the rest of the team. Okay, this is even spoiler territory for me, but I have to read it anyway. The Walking Dead, Season 3. After being gone from Rick's group for nine months, Andrea figures that they'll welcome her back happily. Instead, due to her ignorance about the governor's true nature, the group greet her with weapons drawn at her, frisk her of any weapons, and are rather angry at her for her remaining stay at the prison. This trope is used so many times on Law and Order that it's almost expected by fans, but Law and Order Special Victims Unit is where new characters get it the worst, such as with Casey Novak's first day, and both Benson and Stabler treated her like an incompetent who was constantly in their way and bungled their case. The fact that both work in sex crimes and dealing with both of them made her cry by the end of the by the end of her night makes one wonder how she stuck to the job. She didn't win their respect until she was able to locate the missing girl who was hidden in a cooler but alive. The only other person who got it worse than her was Sonia Paxton, who from the very first day none of the characters hid their contempt for, especially Stabler, whose behaviour towards her was bordered and downright misogyny. Unlike Casey though, she was just as antagonistic towards the division and wasn't able to prove herself, but showing up intoxicated to court and wrecking what should have been a slam dunk case after railing about how weak alcoholics are tends to undermine a person. She did eventually return a few years later and was able to assist the detectives, but that came at too steep of a price. Also, it can be expected for the new character to make a derisive comment about the person they replaced. With or without this trope coming into play, or even if the one doling it, at doling out the unfriendliness, with one of the few exceptions being Fontana never having a cross word for Briscoe for obvious reasons. And with that guys we end part two. Part three will wrap up this look at the chili reception and the sea tropes. With the categories of video games, western animation and real life. Until then. Bye. Hello everyone, uh, hello fellow tropers, and welcome to episode 9 of Tropecast, the show where I come on eat, yep, in each episode and look at a trope. One per letter of the alphabet, this is trope C for series 1, we're going to be wrapping it up today, Jelly Reception Part 3, Video Games. Sakura Wars. In Sakura War in Sakura Wars So Long My Love, the main male in brackets character, Shinjiro Tiger, gets this from the veteran members of the Star Division. They were expecting the commander of the Flower Division 
not the not his rookie nephew with qualifications but no experience Chiron and Sajita or Chiron slash Sajita is loudly hostile Subaru has no time for an ineffective rookie and seniors Ratchet and Sunnyside don't really know what to do with him well Ratchet doesn't Sunnyside might have been expecting this this is adding insult to injury for Shinjiro he thought he was joining the Japanese flower division force was punted across to the USA instead and was met by hostility and hazing when he got there of course it's largely a dating sim so you can guess how it all pans out Shinjiro is actually carrying on a family tradition of chilly receptions his prestigious uncle Ogami got much the same treatment from the flower division as a secret test of character although Sakura the victim of this in the anime escaped this treatment for the games in Halo Reach you're informed at the beginning that you're being brought in to replace a well-liked member of the team who the others would have preferred to honour by leaving the spot empty this doesn't have much of an effect on gameplay but in a couple of cutscenes some characters are dismissive or just ignore you except George by the end of the game this is of course entirely gone Western animation Prince Zuko is understandably shut down in his attempts to join the Avatar's party in book 3 of Avatar's, uh, Avatar The Last Airbender having been an antagonist of the group for most of their travels even after the travels have it, uh, others have accepted him it takes some time for Katara who was personally betrayed by Zuko at the end of book 2 to stop giving him the treatment my Little Pony, the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic episode Newbie Dash shows that a chilly reception is institutionalized by a tradition in the Wonderbolts Equestria's elite flying squad. Regardless of how popular the retiring Pegasus is, or how eager the Bolts are to have their new team member, every newbie is given an embarrassing nickname based on something they did on their first day which becomes an appreciated appellation and call sign so an appropriated appellation and call sign also enforced and given extra chores for not knowing all the flight drills right away even Rainbow Dash whom the bolts adore of her own accomplishments as much as she has worshipped them since she was a foal receives this treatment and our real life examples newbies on forums in all but the friendliest or best shepherded forums they get shouted down in discussions mocked for their ignorance of forum rules be they major or minor and are wide open to sympathy less measures by zealous and overbearing and bad tempered moderators kinder moderators and forum members make allowances for newcomers but there's a different forum persona who considers them prey some newbies earn this, earn this ire from fellow forum goers others are just unlucky needless to say truth in television for the new kid at school to the new signing for a football team we've all seen it 
Many human beings will be a complete jerk ass to people they don't know. In some institutions, hazing or bullying a newcomer is standard practice, and even the people in charge of making sure no one gets hurt will be loath to step in. And that, guys, wraps up our look at the trope used for letter C in this season or series. So we move on to a D trope next time on the beginning. I'll announce what that's going to be. It's going to be the downer beginning. So join me for that next time. Until then, or join me for the start of that next time. Until then, bye.